Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Tailoring in Conversation. In this series, I'll be interviewing tailors from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Claudia Chan. Claudia spent most of her time as a bespoke cutter at Simpson McDonald in Bloomsbury, and she's currently working as an in-house cutter for Alexa Chung, a women's wear ready-to-wear label based in Bebovoir, Hackney. Let's get started. Well, thank you very much, Claudia, and uh, welcome to this conversation. Um, uh, first of all, I have to ask you, how are you today and uh, what's up? Yeah, good. Um, I just came back from work, um, but uh, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, it's been good. Um, I can't complain. Um, being busy during this difficult time, I think it's in a way, I think for me anyway, it's a blessing, actually. Okay, well, that's good. That's good to hear. Ha- have you personally been uh, affected by COVID a lot, uh, work-wise or well, health-wise? I don't imagine, but yeah, work-wise. I think um, last year I was furloughed in my previous job for quite a while, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, it, it was great in the sense that I actually got uh, to take some time to visit my fr- family in Hong Kong. I went back home for um, a few months, and it was mm-hmm. great. Um, but I did miss like work, and I think I'm just someone who who, who kind of likes and needs work um, to thrive as a person. And yes. so when I found this um, current job uh, in fashion, I I did I, I jumped on it because I thought like I needed like to be busy again and stuff. Um, so yeah, I think. I think COVID definitely like did something, you know, to our head. It's inevitable. I don't know one person who's entirely, you know, happy with COVID. Mm. Um, and I, I would, I, I dare to say, even if they say they are, they're lying. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, but I think like work really like gave me a huge sense of um, purpose and routine more than anything mm-hmm. else. Um, right. So yeah. Okay, Claudia, if, if this is a question I ask everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if, if me and you were 10 years old and uh, we were friends, what would we be doing right now? 10 years old? Wow, 10 years old. Definitely not like sitting in front of a computer chatting to each other. I think I'd rather be out like actually having fun outside. Rather than okay. thinking about tailoring, or <laughs> are you are are you like a like an outdoors person? Do you like uh, do a lot of sports, or I don't know, go out in I the park, or I do like I think like because of my family, um, my parents has always encouraged us to do sports, and as a kid, we sort of detested it, but um, like now, I'm quite into cycling, for example, and it's it, I think if it, it feels great to be out. Um, mm-hmm. it's actually also thanks to like pandemic and our mutual friend, Josh, who, who got me into cycling. Um, and yeah, no, I, I enjoy it. Also, you just, you, you don't have to be thinking about work all the time when you are outside, you know, mm-hmm. I do sometimes, but I tend to do that a lot more when I'm inside, like even when you just wake up and things, but when you're indoor, you I don't know, for me anyway, it invet- inevitably you just like roll on thinking about work, basically. Do you do you spend most of your spare time working as well? If you have a day off, do you kind of like get back to the not not entirely. It depends because I do my own thing on the side, apart from my full time um, employment at Alexa Chung. And if it's busy, then yeah, like I will be working. But if it's not, I try to like um, go and, and go and even like just cycle on my own for half a day or something. Just do mm-hmm. do something. I, I'm someone who quite enjoy being on my own. Um, I don't know if it's because of COVID as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I do like to spend time outside, actually. OK, well, well, well I, I, I think that now, thankfully, everything is easing up. Uh, we can all enjoy a little bit of uh, outside uh, yeah. fun, let's say. Um, how? Uh, well, let, let's 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 go back a few years, right? So, 
you said that you're you're this outgoing kid and and mm -hmm. you prefer to be outside you're encouraged by your parents to to do sports you detest it mm -hmm. uh, what were the things that you were most interested in when you were a child how was what what kind of like world were you living in yeah i think my family has always said that even now claudia lives in a in her own bubble <laughs> Um, Why is that? Yeah, maybe they're right. I think I, I've always, when I like something, I, I am really into it. And, and I don't really hide neither. Like when I was a kid, I wanted to become a vet, actually, because I like animals so much. Animals mm -hmm. and all sorts. Um, we've always had dogs and stuff. Um, in fact, if, uh, someone I know have contacted me asking if I would like to, you know, do some tailoring for docs and I'm thinking of taking it on, you know, <laughs> like do that. Wow. So what, you're, you'll be making like uh, well, something? Well, possibly cutting, but I, I don't know yet. I haven't committed to it yet. Um, I got okay. like other human projects to finish off before <laughs> committing more to docs, you know. But uh, yeah, I think I wanted, I, I liked, um, I think I... I liked being around people, but I also like like um, spending time on my own, even as a kid. Um, and my parents are quite, I think they are both quite creative in their own ways. Um, my father is a handbag designer. Uh, he used to be anyway. My mom, um, who recently retired, she's an architect. So they're, right. yeah, they, they, they never pushed us to do, you know, art or anything, actually. They actually rather bring us up in the mountains and just do mountain bikes instead um, of, you know, overstudying and stuff, which is quite unusual for Chinese parents, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it, it, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do until I was probably 16, 17. I went to Italy to did uh, one year of exchange, like a uh, exchange program. Um, and I studied art in um, a high school in Italy and I loved it. Um, in Italy, the way they teach you how to draw and stuff is still the same way they taught Michelangelo and Da Vinci and that lot. Basically, you just sit there, you draw like, anatomical skulls and muscles for hours before you actually draw the nude model and you do this six days a week like seven eight hours a day quite like repetitively so after a year of doing that i realized i i wanted to do i wanted to work with human bodies uh, well something about anatomy i didn't think i i i, I really liked painting but I don't think I, I'm, I wasn't sure if I could make a living out of it. And I don't want to be eating, you know, beans on toast for the rest of my life. So, <laughs> so um, I decided to um, look for like something that's closest to anatomy, but that's still a craft. And, and, and I wrote on to tailoring, basically. That's how I ended up. Right. So uh, how, how old were you when you started now to think about tailoring? Um, I was 17, 18. I can't remember exactly. 18, probably. And, and at this time, you had come back to London or right, you were still yeah. in Italy? Well, so I, went, I finished GCSE in Hong Kong. Then I went to Italy for a year. Then I mm -hmm. came to London straight. And I enrolled to um, like a, a course in London College of Fashion. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, eventually it was like a, eventually a bachelor degree um, specialized in bespoke tailoring. But I have mm -hmm. to say, like most of what I know now, I think it's more, you know, I learned them mostly from the job, on the job, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. a college. I mean, the thing that I, I did enjoy in LCF is the connection with people. Like some of my mm -hmm. very close friends now, uh, they are from LCF, but... Most of them didn't study tailoring, I'll say. Um, right. So how, how, mm -hmm. how did you find LCF at the time? Uh, how was the whole, uh, whole entering of the course and, and the things right. you were so, taught? Yeah, I think after Italy, I enrolled to a foundation course. It wasn't straight on bespoke tailoring. I did this foundation course um, for the first year, and then I realized that most of, I think 90% of the class wanted to do design. Most people wanted mm -hmm. to go into design, and 
I just I wasn't that keen. I'm more I think I'm more of an engineering person maybe. Like I mm-hmm. I do enjoy you know painting and sketching and all that, but I'm not the kind of person who likes to just sit and sketch lots of things without mm-hmm. really making it happen. I'd rather like execute it. So right. yeah, that's why I I was like I'm going to do tailoring and everyone sort of laughed. <laughs> and said oh that one's gonna be the nerd <laughs> you know they were all very cool and all that now they call me up and ask if i can make patterns for them so it's a- well, good good cho- good choice that's the, definitely a good choice um do you you said you learned most of the things you learned on the job rather than from from the course mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. well what, what I mean, sort of things i shouldn't say that in case someone from elsia <laughs> No, that, that's not true. I mean, at, at London College of Fashion, they've taught you, they teach you how to do um, a, a pair of trousers, waistcoat and jacket on the first year. And mm-hmm. then on second year, you started to progress into creating your own designs, but very tailoring mm-hmm. related. Um, and I think on the third year, it's like the main collection sort of thing. Um, and I can't remember when, but there's a, a, a sort of compulsory work experience slotted in between. And that was mm-hmm. when I really knew like, okay, I want to go into cutting. Um, I went to do my work placement in Sweden. Um, and after spending six months in glorious Stockholm in the summer, it's it's amazing. It's like, you know, daylight almost all day long. Um, I came back and I decided, okay, I'm going to like work. I, 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 I finished my collection um, and then mm. I graduated and I thought, okay, I want to become a cutter, at least try, you know, and I was very fortunate that a month after I graduated, I found um, the job in Canada Dandy on Savile Row and I just rolled on from there to be honest. Right, right. So you you okay, I've got a couple of questions. So you mm. also worked for Canada Dandy, you say. Mm. Um okay, before I go into that, um why did you choose cutting? Why did you didn't you go for like the uh, trouser making so, or yeah. I don't know. Actually, I was training in trouser making um, when I was in Sweden at, at at the start. Well, I kind of was just there like, you know, as any, I guess, work apprentice, you start from doing anything like trimmings. Well, I did trimmings a lot at the start. And um, and then eventually it, it was a small company and and the owners were really nice to me. Um, one day, one of them who, who does the cutting just said like, just come and he started showing me cutting and I think I don't know if it was him seeing that um, I I had something for it or what but he he sort of like guided me into that route eventually Mm -hmm. and I think that was when I realized like okay drop the trousers I'm going to hold did you did you feel that you know all the things like uh coat making, cutting, trouser making, all those things, from all the, those elements that cutting would probably be the, the thing you would be really good at? Probably, yeah. I think um, I liked trouser making. I think also be, just because I'm someone who loves, I, I prefer wearing trousers than anything else, I think. Um, mm. I really liked it. But I think definitely like starting from trouser making, it helped me to cut like better trousers, I would say. Um, Mm -hmm. and I did like some coat making with the other owner who's uh, the the, the head coat maker there, which was really good. Um, but I think, yeah, I would say like, I find myself most comfortable and confident while, you know, just freehanding with the chalk and stuff. He was, uh, the person who taught me that he he was Danish and he was very much a freehand guy. Um, which at first I was like, okay, what am I doing here? Um, but he just said, you need to free your mind, you know, <laughs> it, it was, it, it was amazing. Like, I mean, even right. up to this day, I, I still remember him telling me that and it, it has worked for me so far, to be honest, like the, mm. the more I let go of my, you know, trying not to control my hand too much, the better the lines get sometimes. Uh, did you find that the tailoring in uh, or the tailors in Sweden were working in similar ways as the tailors in London? 
You know what? There aren't many uh, tailors actually in um, in Sweden. Uh, I think in the whole Scandinavia, um, mm-hmm. suits are not like tailoring stuff. It's not, I guess, their main like work a tear. Um, and they are more like outdoors. You know, they like like rock climbing, and you can't really rock climb in in a suit. Like rock climbing is just an example. But you know, they're very sportive people. I think. Mm. But now I think in Sweden, the Swedes have like a flair for um, for tailoring stuff, um, mm-hmm. which is why I think Ken and Dandy also collect, like opened a shop there. Um, from what I right. yeah. Um, so there is a market there, but. I would say, yeah, they the owners in Sweden, in the place where I work, which is called Bauer, they were trained mainly in Sweden, but they also did experience in Henry Paul, I think. So oh, it's yeah. still a little bit like, I think, related to Savile Row, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, similar concept, like, you know, the courtesies, the customer, uh, with all the fittings and stuff and the makers they they focus in making um but they're also very like precise with making um there's this sw- famous swedish like saying it's called lagom i don't know if you've heard of it l a i think it's l a g double o m and it means when something's just right and just enough mm-hmm. so nothing more and nothing less and that's like that's just their way of life, and it, it's the same in their tailoring. You know, it can't be anything less, but not too much neither. So, like, it's it's mm-hmm. very precise, I would say. Okay, okay, okay. So, so you you go through this period, and then uh, you go and was after you came back from Sweden, did you go to Cadna Dandy, or did you have well, uh, something uh, after else? Sweden? I went back to mm-hmm. college uh, for half a year, maybe, or. Mm-hmm. A bit more and and then I graduated I didn't really know what I was going to do I was sort of prepared to maybe move back to Hong Kong but then yeah as I said I was very lucky like through some connection I I got this job in Cat and the Dandy so I stayed there for like uh, under just under two years I think um, <laughs> and I then went to my last job uh, in Sims and McDonald, and I stayed in Sims for four years. Okay, so so were you doing bespoke cutting at Cadna Dandy as well? Yeah, yeah, and a lot of uh, customer like client facing actually because uh-huh. they are very busy like compared to I think other Savile Row tailors. Um, mm-hmm. They had a bigger quantities uh, every month than anyone else I know, um, so it was quite like you know, full on. But I, again, I made some very good friends in, in that job. And even up to this day, I still see them, you know, or I'm still in touch with them. The the other day, I actually went to see the, the head cutter that I used to work with there, David. Um, it's just like, I, I've been, I would say I've been, you know, fairly blessed with, um, with you, like people, um, Mm -hmm. Uh, in my career of course there are also you know like experiences that are not great but in general I would say pretty much in every job I've always had like a few people that I that that I really cherish in 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 life and it's not just you know I don't just see them as um, I guess like uh, good friends like some of them are kind of my mentor in life and Mm -hmm. I think being like alone uh, and far away from home, it means a lot. Um, well, yeah, I, I this is this is a, such an important thing that you bring up because, uh, you know, uh, tailoring is not something you just do a little bit once a week or something. You know, when you commit to it, it's like most tailors that I know work like seven days a week. And, you know, when you are in a job or in a career where you are working seven days a week or at least at least five full-on long hour, you know, long days. Uh, uh, it's, it's very important who you have around you. And, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to be able to stay in a place for a very long time, your colleagues do kind of like turn into friends and then sometimes even into family. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't think of any other way uh, how, how that 
you know, how one could go through a career with people uh, without being able to connect to them. You know, it's like it's so difficult to jump from one place to another and meet. I mean, it's great to meet people every time, but you also need the time to build a relationship. Uh, Absolutely. Like trust right? is, the, is the thing that like you can't gain with money or anything. I think it's time and mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you need time to gain trust and, and you need trust to become a family kind of thing, I mm -hmm. think. Um, how, do you, uh, how do you think that that works in, in, in our industry? Because obviously, you know, most people, they, they get trained in some place and then they go to another place, uh, maybe, or they just go freelance or if they're lucky enough, they stay with the same company. But uh, staff turnover is, is, is not really a, an ideal thing for a tailoring company because of the time that you spend to train someone. Uh, do you, do you, do you, have you experienced like in, in your journey uh, and the places you were or people who you spoke to who were working at other places, um, a high turnover in staff? Did, did, did you, was that a thing? Yeah, I would say, I mean, it might be a sensitive thing to talk about, but um, yeah, I did. I did see that like a bit in um, in in several houses, perhaps mm -hmm. even well was cat. Yeah, I think like back in the days, like tailors just stick to one shop for like mm -hmm. decades, right? But now I think things has changed, and um, for whatever for many reasons, um, people move around, but. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think it's it might not be you know the loyalty that 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 matters. It's more like how people treat each other. I think. Um, right. I you know for example like where I am, it's I, I feel really good because people are nice, and that even when it's stressful and and things, you know you have a you have a good laugh and you have you do good banter and it doesn't matter so much that. The work is tough, you know. It's um, mm -hmm. because you know you're working as a team, and I think that is the most important thing um, mm -hmm. to keep people around. Um, but yeah, I think in well, in bespoke, it's a very, very tiny trade, and yes. it's uh, it's 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 so hard sometimes because of how small it is. I mean, the mm -hmm. Savile Row is. This, this tiny street let's be honest even yes yeah even you know even if we are talking about city tailors and all that as well it's still they aren't more than what 50 mm -hmm. like, tailors around. no maybe even not, not 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 even that i think um right yeah which is actually it's part of the reason why like i sort of jumped out for a bit because i just thought i wanted to get a new perspective on things because sometimes mm -hmm. I felt like maybe during the pandemic especially that I spent so much time in isolation I started thinking like okay maybe I'm I'm you know slowly being stuck uh, with my vision a little bit mm -hmm. there's a Chinese saying of um, a frog uh, being stuck under a well and 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 he thinks that that's the world, you know. And I, mm -hmm. I, I worried that okay, maybe, am I slowly becoming that like that frog, like think, turning into a frog? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thinking like all that water in the well is the sea, mm -hmm. you know, when mm -hmm. the world is so much bigger. And I, I just wanted like some perspective. That's why I, I jumped out. I decided to to just take the leap of faith and boom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Production. Well, yeah, yeah, no, no. That, that I think that's a good thing. And also, uh, talking about high turnovers in staff. You know, obviously, people may look at that and say, "Well, that's a bad thing." But I'm pretty sure that there is also a, a good element to that because, you know, it's good when people move around and they get to talk. You know, you, what you see in this company is something you don't see in another company, and so. I think that dynamic environment is eventually necessary. But Claudia, you you are experienced, well, you have experienced both uh, as a bespoke cutter, but also you're working uh, in, in for oh, for a ready to wear, yeah. uh, let's say uh, label. Yeah. And you you you're learning new things. You're seeing new methods, yeah. new techniques. Uh, 
can you please talk a little bit about uh, cutter, uh, being a cutter in, in, in a bespoke environment and being a cutter in, in a manufacturing environment yeah. and how you see the differences? I can see you're already kind of like, you yeah. know, lighting up. And I so, love all uh, this. Perfect. Yeah, oh, yeah, this yeah. yeah. So, so talk, love it. talk us a little bit through that. Yeah, all these Facebook cutters, like no offense, but <laughs> um, no, um, I think the biggest difference is probably that in production, you have to be really precise um, with mm -hmm. everything you cut and you have to think a lot more thoroughly um, into the make, you have mm -hmm. to think for the person who's going to be sewing it because most likely the the product will be made abroad by someone who does not speak the same language and you have to make sure that, th that this paper pattern will be delivered to this factory offshore where they don't understand possibly like English, whatever, but they can just see, look at your pattern and go to the machine and sew. Like you, right. it has to be so um, highly communicative. The pattern itself needs to mm -hmm. be so well, um, like uh, I guess well presented. Otherwise they, mm -hmm. they don't know what to do when they go to the machine, which is why in production tailoring, not just is like the goddess, you know, the God <laughs> for every, yeah. for every patterns because it's, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, from my, even though I've only been in the, my current company for about six months, um, I can already see like, you know, most of the stuff that comes back from factory, hmm. if, if I don't put enough notches in things, they don't look as nice, probably like you have to spend a lot of time in planning how mm -hmm. the machinist is going to sew it. Well, as in bespoke. You, you you cut the job and a lot of the times you sort of, you know, ask your tailor friend or, or, or whoever, coat maker, trouser maker, you sort of just expect them to turn magic. <laughs> right. When you, okay, so here, a, a wide range of questions, okay? Uh, I'll, I'll ask a few and then you, you pick which one you go into, right? So... When, when you say you're working with a, a lot of notch, notches and you also say that the pattern has to be very communicative, mm. are those notches uh, one of the elements that makes a pattern communicative or are there other things that the pattern should have to communicate well? I think notches is definitely like on the top list of making mm -hmm. it communicative. Um, but also like just every line needs to match, every ease needs to be indicated. Um, mm -hmm. You know how in, in, in bespoke, I mean, I obviously bespoke cutters, everyone cut differently, but I know like uh, quite a lot of bespoke cutters I know, they don't really like um, um, mark like the pitch and stuff for the tailor, for example. And they just, I mean, some of them don't even, I was told that some of them don't even measure the ease before they cut the sleeves um, right. or before they give it to the tailor. So it's, a lot of the times it ends up that bespoke tailors have to, bespoke coat makers have to recut the sleeves or whatever, which, you know, <laughs> in return lead to, it can lead to a lot of like, I don't know, miscommunication. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, usually, like it, it turns out good, but but then what if the customer wants another uh, carbon copy of the suit? Then you sort of risk the chance of modifications mm -hmm. not being done the same way on the second one as compared to the first jacket, kind of. That sort of thing. Well, as in production, you can't make those errors. Also, because most of the time it will be, you know. It's not just one jacket. It will be mm -hmm. like a slightly bigger production. I mean, Alexa Chung, where I work, um, it might not be, you know, um, like mass, mass production, like high street brands or m big brands like Gucci and Prada. But still, you know, it's multiple uh, quantities we are talking about. So right. if your pattern is not good enough, it... You can be, so say for example, uh, the same top or dress 
um, needs to be produced in different factories um, in different countries. And if your patterns are is not spot on enough, you it, the dresses will come back and they will look different. I mean, it, it happens anyway that, you know, in fact, every factory do things differently. But if you can get the pattern like done well, it helps immensely, I would say. Whereas in, right. in spoke, it doesn't have to be as precise and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I just, I just think that like, I, I really feel for like people who, who work in production cutting actually after I started in this job because it's mm -hmm. more, it feels like it, it's, it's almost like more work. Um, so oh, did you, did, did you feel that the skills you gained as a bespoke cutter were actually beneficial for this job or did you find that no you really had to relearn things or, or okay. learn a lot of new things how was that no actually i think um a big reason why i was hired was because of my experience in in bespoke probably um because mm -hmm. for the tailoring stuff although mm -hmm. i do certain stuff in the computer because i was trained looking at um, bespoke patterns it helps like uh, to work very efficiently with the computer for example armhole shapes and stuff like if you don't have experience in bespoke it's you, you your armhole it, the computer can generate a really like ridiculous looking armhole and you don't know how to fix and you won't know how to fix it well as because I was trained for quite a few years in bespoke it definitely helped um, mm. but certain things, yeah, I had to learn like, um, you know, uh, cutting lining and, and facing patterns like precisely. It's not like how in, in bespoke again, the tailor, you just lay the, 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 the side body, the back body, the back panel on the lining. And then you sort of just gauge oh one inch from there, from the inlay and you just cut around it right like we can't work like that everything has to have a bloody pattern it's well here's a question why why do you think that tailoring has not adapted to the methods that you guys are using while what you guys are doing is first of all not only a lot more precise it's also a lot more economical in terms of uh, fabric use and lining use or whatsoever and it's a lot more efficient because the person who receives what you've been cutting out mm. only needs to just put it together. Uh, and, 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 and if anything, you would expect that a bespoke tailoring company would want to have all of those points covered instead of, you know, just hitting a target somewhere in the air and then missing it by like a little bit there and a little bit there. And then the tailor doesn't have enough fit up or the tailor uh, doesn't have pitch marks for the, for the color or the sleeves or whatsoever. Mm. Why do you think that tailors haven't adapted to that uh, so far uh, as we speak? I think it's the mindset of, you know, preserving the tradition of how to do things a certain way. It's a big, like, I guess it, it hinders you from, it underpin you from moving forward sometimes, I think. Um, and there is a charm to it. Like, it's like, you know, still, if you tell someone that you're writing them a letter rather than sending an email, there is a bit of a charm to it, right? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the same um, mentality, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people think that, you know, I'm talking utter bollocks about <laughs> uh, how, how, how good, like, production cutting can be. Um, I, I don't necessarily think, you know, oh, I only favor one one type of cutting. I think what I like is the the sort of liberty and knowledge to do both. I think it's what I, I really enjoy. But yeah, I think the main reason why Facebook cutters won't really move on to that is probably also because there isn't so much the need to like, I guess, be so time and labor efficient because you're charging quite a lot of money from the client to do the job. And I think people who pay for bespoke suits, they want things done in the old school way as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well from, from, from the things that you've experienced so far, um, 
And this is, I think, probably like almost like, well, it's not a million dollar question, but it's an important question for especially people who are doing tailoring as uh, in the bespoke section. Mm -hmm. um, do you think from what you have seen so far and the possibilities that we have today that a pattern made on the computer, perfectly engineered with like 300 notches can be made, can be sewn by someone who maybe hasn't done a six years apprenticeship, but by putting those notches together and using the, the correct materials, let's say, and the interlinings and all of that, they could still derive um, or, or get to a sculpted looking, let's say, jacket. Mm. So you're saying that if um, if the pattern was cut uh, by well someone with a computer, can it still be made by some by a coat maker who hasn't got as much experience? Um, almost. So 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 let's 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 re try to rephrase that a little bit more. If you have a tailor who's very skilled, right, mm -hmm. and you give them a average pattern which is not engineered mm -hmm. and they will make something that looks a little bit sculpted and it looks bespoke mm -hmm. let's say and on the other hand you have a tailor who is not very skilled who doesn't do handwork uh -huh. but the pattern is engineered so well that if you put the notches together mm. you more or less get the same sculpted look is that possible you know i am someone who actually thinks that coat makers should be more respected than <laughs> cutters and it's it's a hard question because I, I I personally think it's it 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 can be close to the first jacket but I still think having a skilled tailor makes a difference I would say um just because there are so many like intricate details in making a suit that mm -hmm. in, in bespoke, you, you only learn that through experience. You can't buy that with money. You, you can't, yeah, you have to earn it. You have to use your time to, and work hard to earn it, I think. O obviously, talent takes pays part of it as well, but I am also someone who believes that without hard work, like you can be the most talented person, but <laughs> complete like, you know, <laughs> do, you, do you say airhead in English? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can have talent, but if you don't want to put in the effort, like child. Um, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's a very interesting question, actually. And I was like, it is something that actually I'm looking to explore myself. Mm -hmm. um, now that I've been doing a lot more production uh, cutting, but yeah, I was always told in um, in bespoke by like hair cutters and everyone that you can be the best cutter, but if you don't have a, a good coat maker or a trouser maker, mm -hmm. it doesn't like your final product probably won't look that great. So I actually think that personally. Cutters are in bespoke are a bit, perhaps a bit overrated, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I know like, like tailors tend to be more introverts, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. I ac actually think that the trade, you know, owns a lot of, uh, owes a lot of credit to makers personally. Um, yes, no, I, 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 I actually think the same thing because, uh, and, and this is a, a very interesting insight um, that purely because of the, the, let's say, the process of, of creating a garment and, and the cutters maybe not giving a super engineered pattern to the tailor, it has uh, more or less throughout the years forced the tailors to develop certain skills um, to, to have the ability to fix certain flaws maybe in the in the pattern or maybe just certain add things <laughs> cert, certain flaws or even add things add things that aren't there in the pattern you know and and and, and that's where the art of tailoring and mastery comes in mm. uh, whereas now from 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 the things that i've uh, uh, heard and understood in in the manufacturing part is that 
the cutter is the person that really needs to know what they're doing mm. if they want to have a successful uh, result. In production, yes, definitely. I think in production, mm. like if you have a good pattern cutter in, in your company, you you will ace it like much easier. Um, mm. Also, because like in, in, in production, you have to communicate with the design team a lot. So it doesn't matter how good an illustrator um, or how stylish the designers are. If you don't have mm -hmm. someone to execute it into patterns, mm -hmm. there's like no point. I think it, it, it all works like two ways, I think. And it's the yeah. same in tailoring, um, which is why when I see that, you know, cutters, some cut, certain cutters like think they're better than the makers or whatever, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it because without well, I, the makers, I, there's no way your, your suit is going to look good. You know, I, I'd like to see, um, uh, a bespoke cutter, wo uh, working for a manufacturing, um, company for like a week and then, uh, and then see what happens. Well, what do you think would happen if a, if a manufacturing cutter, um, works with a bespoke tailor and what do you think would happen if a bespoke tailor would work uh, no if a yeah if a manufacturing tailor would work with a bespoke cutter mm. um i think if someone who has been only doing production jumps into bespoke it might mm. you know they will definitely find it very odd because of the way simply just because of the way seam allowances work in bespoke patterns is the mm. most illogical thing ever when you actually know about production tailoring it's it doesn't make sense why on a neck point of a jacket have you got no seam allowance on the the, the, the that this part but the, and yet you have got three eight of an inch or a quarter of an inch on the shoulder it doesn't make any <laughs> sense why is there no seam allowance on the center back seam on of a jacket and yet again on the shoulder you get you have a seam and and on the hem on the bottom of a jacket you have no seam again like things like this it's just it doesn't make <laughs> bespoke patterns kind of don't doesn't make any sense um if you send, if I send my standard, say, men's 40s jacket to one of our factories at work, the jacket is going to come back absolutely like crap. I'm not even going to start swearing, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it won't look good at all because it doesn't make sense to them. And mm. well, as in production, you have, you know, like standard seam allowances, um, you notch everything. It, it's a lot more logical. Um, so I think for someone from it, production, if a production cutter decides to jump into bespoke, I think they will really struggle, which is why I don't really think there are any people who, who does that. Like mm. bespoke cutters are usually trained either from scratch or like someone who hasn't really done any cuttings at all. Um, but for a bespoke cutter to go into production, I think it's more... It's 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 a bit more adaptable. It took me a while to adapt, um, but it's it's possible because it's more logical, mm. in a way. You know, um, it's that's a that's an interesting question. I did ask myself that when I you know when I decided to go for the job, I questioned like, oh, well, can I you know will I be okay and stuff? But actually, I think the trick is once you always start working with net and then you just mm -hmm. add seam allowance to things, it's quite straightforward with production tailoring. And yeah. this like amazing CAD program, you do some clicks, you enter some numbers, they do all the seam allowance for you. I don't have to be messing around with my ruler and you know, it's just- it's Yeah, yeah, I could. I can perfectly imagine the joy of that. Um, you, you, you mentioned communication and that you're sometimes communicating with people uh, in other countries who, mm -hmm. who have to use the pattern or, you know, there are technical things that you need to go back and forth. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about communication and uh, 
well, the necessity that, that, that one has. I mean, obviously, if you're working in a, in, a, in a workshop and you're just working for the same tailoring house for like many years, you may not, well, obviously, you, you will need communication skills, but you don't need as many communication skills as you would if you're constantly working with people from all different countries. Mm -hmm. um, what, what would you say are the maybe three most important communication skills that a tailor should have especially if they are planning to go into working in it for for production and manufacturing mm, i think to be open-minded is quite important because you never know the production team might assign you a factory in a country where not let alone you have never been but like you know, you just don't know the people and you have to be open-minded um, mm -hmm. with them. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I also have some like middlemen uh, to deal with a uh, factory at work and stuff. But sometimes I, I do have to like sort out pattern inquiries and mm -hmm. stuff with them. And, um, and, and, and I think like not to panic when you see an unknown language printed on your pattern. <laughs> it's, it's quite... <laughs> An important thing, you know, I, for example, I don't speak Polish and we have mm -hmm. this Polish factory who just basically added a lot of Polish stuff on my patent. And you, 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 you can't really like panic. You just have to like give it a go. I think that's quite important to, to have the courage to do that. I think it, it's, it's, it's quite essential for production, um, tailoring. And also it's more. I would say it's more like um, uh, planning work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's part of communication. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm someone who quite like like challenges. So it, it's, it's, it's a good thing for me. But I think if you are quite comfortable with like, you know, just working within, you know, uh, like you said, uh, 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 the same company or whatever, like then your yeah, production might not be your thing because it's like new bombs every other day kind of thing mm. land on your, on your board. Um, yeah, what else apart from commute? Ah, um, I think to communicate between the design team and the production team is also very important because you have to be realistic, I think. Um, a lot of the times, also with budget and stuff. Uh, that's the, another huge difference of bespoke tailoring and production tailoring. I feel like in bespoke, the budget is not as much of an issue sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. um, as say in production when you have to calculate about margins and stuff a lot more. Um, it's not my main job, but... Mm -hmm it is my job to sort of think of what's the most economical way to cut things. As mm -hmm. simple as an A-line skirt, if you have a patterned cloth, you need to think of like different ways. Like if the company is really under budget with this dress, mm -hmm. you might have to like advise your the production team to find a cloth that's perhaps plain so you can cut it across mm -hmm. the grain, uh, sorry, um, perpendicular to the grain rather than across, mm -hmm. things like this. Um, mm -hmm. It's like like thinking about cost is quite important, but um, the skill of like working with people mm -hmm. is important in Bespoke because you see clients and that that's one mm -hmm. thing that I, I think I'm, I'm grateful for in Bespoke, like obviously, it's a very certain type of people who comes to buy bespoke stuff, but still like the, 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 I think like the, the, the communication skill you, you, you learn, it's always like useful in any mm -hmm. environment, I would say. I mean, in Alexa Chung, I would say we are also more, um, perhaps open-minded and dive, like diverse, like, in terms of race and gender as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, I mean, most of my colleagues are British, but um, mm -hmm. we are like, we, we do have like freelance um, mm -hmm. people working with us, which are from everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think in bespoke, it's still, it's changing, mm-hmm. but it's still quite a white man dominated environment, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but hopefully, you know, it, that, that, that is changing, I think. I think I see a lot more like female as mm-hmm. well in the trade. Um, but yeah, that it's definitely like not the same. I mean, I'm not saying that fashion has no racial issues. I'm not saying that at all. Mm-hmm. But I would say in comparison, this book mm-hmm. is a little bit more traditional. I'm hoping mm-hmm. our generation have a different mindset and I think mm-hmm. we do, like, um, but I, I've also definitely met people in Bespoke who are still, you know, quite used to the their, their white privilege mindset, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you, uh, how, how, how did, in, in the environment of, uh, of manufacturing, when you guys have to decide to make something, like, let's say a technical change, right? You have to bring like a new change into something that you're doing or something that you are thinking of improving. What, who, what sort of conversations do you guys have and how do you conduct those conversations? Because you know we're very well, like it's very difficult to go to a tailoring house and say, hey guys, I think you should do this this way now because that's uh, a, a, an improvement. Mm. Most of the time, the, what you're going to hear is like, no, that's not what we do here. It's not our house style. It's not this. It's not that. Mm-mm. But whereas in production, you, you, you know, you're more technically orientated. Um, How do the, those conversations go? Yeah. I mean, it's mainly um, because our brand our label is very much centered around Alexa Chung, the TV presenter. So mm. it's a lot about what she likes. Um which perhaps makes it easier because basically we are kind of mass producing her wardrobe kind of thing. Um, Mm. And she will tell me what she likes. I will tell her if it's not feasible and she's very like good at, you know, um, I guess, I don't know if negotiating is the word, but um, Mm. when I first joined, she definitely like told me like, you need to chuck all those traditional way of, you know, tailoring rules, whatever. Um, working here because we don't work like that. And it's true, like, it's more freestyle, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of changes, I'm kind of my own boss, so I can decide on what to do, really, uh, mm-hmm. which I, I quite like, actually. Um, and obviously, like, I handle the start of the production mainly. And mm-hmm. when it's starts becoming prototypes and all that um they there's a production team and garment tech uh in production who starts to take over from there unless there are major changes or problems i don't mm-hmm. really have to get too involved in at that stage usually so at mm-hmm. that at their stage they are probably just going to change like sleeve length and stuff sometimes the style might change drastically like depending on the designers but um usually you know it's not like huge huge changes mm. well i say okay. that <laughs> but. yeah no I can, I, I can imagine um all right uh last part of 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 mm-hmm. our conversation um I, it's it's a speed round that i'd like to do and so i have uh, i have a few uh, topics or words and I'll just I'll I'll just go through them one by one, mm-hmm. and then you let me know the first thing that pops up your mind. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So starting with the first one, made to measure. Made to measure. The first thing that comes to my mind. Yes. Wow. It's it's I guess it's the compromise between bespoke and ready to wear. Compromise between the bespoke and ready to wear. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You would say. Uh, I think I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily bad when someone has a budget. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's still better if you have a slightly difficult shape and you can't afford a bespoke suit, which mm-hmm. you know most people can't. Let's be honest. I think 
it's still good to have the option to get made to measure actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, maybe I sound like like a socialist or or communist. No. <laughs> No, 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 not at all. Not at, I, th I think, you know, yeah. my personal opinion is that I think made to measure is going to become so incredibly well um, executed and, and, and improved in the next years that, um, you know, most jackets that we're going to see from made to measure is going to be on a very high level, I think, personally. Uh, yeah, but no, okay. definitely. I think, I, I mean, I won't be surprised, actually, if that might be, you know, something that it, it would be next in line for my career because of my skill set and my background, I think. It's yeah. quite... Um, because I kind of think it's... Not, not, not that it's unfair that only certain people can, can, can get these book suits because they can afford it, but I also think there are these people who are really interested or into, like having nice tailored clothes that mm -hmm. they would still like to own for years, not just mm -hmm. buy for like a season and chuck it like high fashion. Um, yeah. And yet they can't afford um, bespoke. So I think it's still a really good option to give, you know, the, I guess not, not just middle class, but like people mm -hmm. want to, to give it a go. I mean, if you can afford bespoke, yeah. of course, great. It's, it's an amazing craft. And I think, Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I would definitely encourage people to support it still. But, like, I'm also a, a very pragmatic and realistic person. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I like to offer the option to people. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, if, if there's the option to opt for bespoke, if you can afford it, yes, sure. But if it's, like, your first sort of, like, experience in getting mm -hmm. something nicely tailored that you can still keep in the wardrobes for a long time then yeah made to measure okay okay next one um savile row <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind is actually snobbishness <laughs> sorry snobbishness oh, so <laughs> hey it's not i'm not saying that as just a bad thing i think it's I think it is what it is because it's it has this flair of snobbishness, you know. And right. yeah, snobbish might sound like I know it's a negative adjective, but it's also a very you know not everyone can be snobbish. Yeah, um, yeah. It's also quite a privileged thing. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So that was my. That's, uh, you asked me for the first word. I give you. Sure, my... sure. No, that that's the fun part. Uh, really. Um, next one. Um, apprenticeships. Apprenticeship. Um, too too like too much unpaid apprenticeships. <laughs> right. Very so, good point. Very good point. Okay. Okay. Um, city tailors. Eh. City, City tailors, yes. Uh, underrated. Underrated. Okay. Mm. Um, the future of tailoring. Ooh, that's a tough one, huh? The future of tailoring. I think. Oh, I wow, that's hard. Oh, that's first, a first very, first very thing. Heavy. First thing on your mind, yeah. First thing on my mind. Mm, I, I won't be surprised if ro robot starts cutting suits, actually. Right, 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 right. Um, okay, okay. I don't know if it's the future. I don't want to say that. I okay, think it would okay. still be a really, like, unique craft, I would say. The future of tailoring. Well, I hope so, too. Cool questions. But it's good. It's really good. I like it. Okay, okay. Um, the most annoying thing about tailoring... Mm, that sometimes um, the stubbornness of tailoring bugs me. Um, Tell that, me more. Uh, that like there are mindsets and, and rules that people are not willing to mm -hmm. even. I'm not. I'm not expecting everyone to change, but not even giving it a go to try mm -hmm. something else. I think. Okay. The Rigidity, stuff. maybe. Eh? 
the rigidity of of of, of maybe yeah, perhaps yeah, sometimes i mean it's the beauty of it but i think it's a bit of a double edge thing yeah okay well the be- what's the best part about tailoring you think the best part of tailoring i think the people mm-hmm. actually um and and the 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 craft i think it's a beautiful craft it's like any other, like, I guess, like, ceramics, um, uh, carpentry, it's, it's, it is a craft. And, mm-hmm. I mean, I kind of contradict to myself because I say that, you know, people are stubborn with how things should be made. I, but I, I, I also think, like, it's important to have a balance, like, to be, mm-hmm. to be innovative enough. Mm-hmm. Um and to preserve the tradition. I think mm-hmm. it's, it's very important to, and I, I, I think I try to be in the middle a lot, actually. Yeah, well, I think that's a very good thing you say because, you know, we, we, we somehow need tradition in order to have a foundation. And at the same time, we also have to be able to update the tradition once in a while. And, you know, when I say update, I don't mean like a revolution, but small things to go to stay kind of like in sync with the times and because if you don't do that then you just die out so you know yeah. and... i i think a um i remember a, a korean artist um once said i forgot his name he had this big exhibition i think in tate more than a few years ago he said um in order to break the rules you have to learn all the rules because how can you break the ground if you don't know the ground pretty much, you know? Yes, so yes, it's yes. It's very important to, that's why I spent so many, like quite a few years in this very traditional craft because I wanted to learn the very like important, I, I wanted to have a very solid foundation mm-hmm. um, before I try anything else, I think. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. really, okay. yeah. Okay, and, and last but not least, Claudia Schiffer. Oh, not as great as Claudia Chan. <laughs> yeah, that's why I named my Instagram as Claudia not Schiffer because yeah. <laughs> my father named me after the German model. And it was a bit of a statement to my dad. Well, I mean, like like lighthearted uh, statement. And I mean, yeah. people find it really really humorous i i mm-hmm. i just i just thought i don't i didn't know what to name how to name myself and i've always sort of you know laughed at my parents of naming a chinese daughter after a german supermodel who is blonde and has blue eyes when yeah, i am yeah. opposite you know so it was a bit of a like a joke to to well, my well the funny the funny part is you had me with that joke because when I looked every time I used to see your Instagram or if you would post something I wouldn't see the not in the word so I would just see Claudia Schiffer and I was like how bizarre you know is that is that really her name so um so yeah it it, it kind of like uh it was funny that it's definitely. funny yeah yeah and I have been told that a lot oh that's a great name and now I really start to think, oh my god, maybe it is like people remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, it, it's it definitely has uh, been one of those names that you do remember. Mm. Um, Claudia, thank you very much for your time. It's thank been a great you. conversation. I hope you enjoyed yes. the conversation as well. Yes, very and, much. Uh, I, I I look forward to do this again, maybe you know, in a year's time or in a few months' time, just mm-hmm. to catch up again and see what new things you have to say about uh, about cutting as uh, as someone who's gained more experience in manufacturing and you've seen more things. And so mm. uh, it's, it's been good to be here with you. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. you okay, have a- bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was Claudia. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to see more of Claudia, you can follow the link to her Instagram in the description of this video. If you have any thoughts or comments, please do let us know and we sure hope to see you again in the next episode. Until then, bye-bye.